Extra time. Hello and welcome back to the Extra Time podcast. It's me, your host, the very croaky Patrick Van Straten, <laughs> and today I'm joined by an elite lineup. I've got Henry Hill here. Hello, Henry. Good morning, Pat. I hope you're feeling okay. Uh, sorry to everyone that the Extra Time podcast is so infrequent at the moment. We're hoping to get it up and running on a more regular basis once again, as mm. it is the content everyone needs. But Pat, how are you feeling? You're right. Uh, I'm a bit grim. I'm off to the doctor after this, um, but I'm hoping I will be perked up by the quality of our content today because <laughs> because this is so infrequent. We've decided to bless you with an extra guest. We've got Zach Jellab with us as well. How are you, Zach? Hello, hello. Yeah, no, really good. Thank you. Very, very good. Um, not croaky. So, is All right. that? Well, <laughs> maybe one day your your maybe one day your voice your voice will break. And then you'll experience, day. you'll experience what it's like. <laughs> One day indeed. Um, I can hope, I can pray. Yeah, seriously though, I'm going to try and talk relatively little in this week's episode. But today we are going to talk about some of the big Brazilian moves of this summer. It seems like it's been a summer of Brazilian wingers, versatile forwards. So today we're going to look at three of the biggest movers. Uh, Richarlison, who obviously has made his move to Tottenham Hotspur. Gabriel Jesus, who's gone to Arsenal, and Rafinha, who looks like he could be winging his way to Barcelona. We're going to look at the three players, what they do, what they don't do, the ways they differ, and how they fit at their different clubs to see which team got the best deal this summer. Mm. And Henry, I know that you've got... One of these has caught your eye in particular, shall we say? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I think they're all good moves it's kind of annoying this year i've been waiting yeah. for a club to make a real blunder in the market and i don't think anyone really has like the one that's annoyed me the most is fulham signing and andreas Pereira. i mean and that's that's like <laughs> the bottom level of how bad it's been this season 13 million pounds on a bloke that scored like seven goals in his life i'm shook but yeah, yeah um so that's Believe it or not, that's a Brazilian. That's a Brazilian that didn't make our podcast <laughs> this week, <laughs> despite technically fitting the criteria. Um, yeah, he could stand for Mengo as far as I'm concerned. Richarlison, I really, really like this move. Actually, on transfer review, we weighed up whether or not Tottenham should go for Rafinha or Richarlison a few weeks ago, and I, I, I plumped for Richarlison because I just think all things considered, next season. He fits the profile of player that they need to fill in on the left flank, to fill in at centre forward. I think he offers a bit more versatility as a player, which perhaps Rafinha doesn't. And a lot of people are going to say a fee rising to £60 million is a lot. And it is a lot of money. Everton were obviously under pressure to look, make some kind of a profit on whatever they paid for him from Watford a few years ago. Uh, and £60 million is a pretty hefty fee. But let's not forget this guy's... A regular in the Brazil national setup, he's, he's he's in above a lot of players over there. I think he's on like 35, 40 caps for his country now. He's he's still pretty young, isn't he? Around the 25 mark, so he's got a lot to give. And actually, when you consider that they've managed to shift Steven Steven Bergvine to Ajax for what 30 million euros, which is ridiculous mm. that they've managed to make some kind of profit on a player that's really been unhappy ever since he touched down in England. I think when you consider that in net spend on Richarlison coming in at about 30 million once again I think that's pretty great business isn't it and they haven't they haven't splashed the cash wildly on their other purchases so far Basuma coming in at 25 million you could argue that that's undervalued so all things all things considered I think actually spending 60 million on Richarlison in a season where there's gonna be so much football and you need that quality in reserve which let's face it Tottenham haven't had for a very very long time uh, I think it's a really smart move. I think it's a really great move. I mean, if we just run through some of his numbers, last season he was by a country mile the best player for Everton, wasn't he? Ten goals and five mm -hmm. assists doesn't sing of like a sixty million pound player. But Everton were honking, weren't they? They were they were awful. I think <laughs> I was I was I was writing that they conceded sixty six goals. That's their worst defensive. That's the most they've conceded since like nineteen seventy five across a top flight campaign. Mm. I mean, they were truly horrific. And, you know, he played a hand in scoring 35% of their total league goals. The other end, missing Calvert-Lewin for a large part of the season. 
Solomon Rondon, who I backed on this podcast to be one of the surprise strikers of the year, <laughs> turned out to be God. quite the opposite, must be said. I'm willing, I'm willing to accept when I get it wrong from time to time. But yeah, I mean, it, I still think Richarlison was pretty great. I mean, it was actually his worst season by XG in three years. Uh, just 0.37 per 90. His shots were pretty down at the lowest since he left Fluminense. But he was, bear in mind, he played half the, half the season in a Rafa Benitez system, which solely relied on hitting teams on the break, didn't they? Um, really disappointing. And he didn't have many creators around him to unleash him in those certain positions. Damari Gray, Townsend, all these players really dropping off later into the season. Decore being an absolute flop. Uh, and but, but what I like about him is in previous years... He has actually been a really selfless talent on the left side, on the left flank. I mean, you see last mm. season his dribbles were down to 1.2 um, from from a high of two carries down from 5.3 to 3.4, etc. That kind of stuff, and uh, that just shows in previous seasons he's been willing to sit back, go into that left flank, put in the defensive dirty work, break the lines a little bit, release Calvert Lewin up front because Calvert Lewin's been a great forward in the past few seasons. So that's what I like about Richarlison. He gets a lot of stick for diving, etc. But I think he's a really selfless player uh, on his day. And I think perhaps that's the kind of qualities that the Brazilian national team set up see as well, considering how many star players they have flowing forward in attack. So, I, yeah, I really I really enjoy sort of what Richarlison offers as an all-round player. And his finishing's pretty decent too. Uh, and I just think in a Conti side where he's going to be required to work hard, uh, chip in as well, I think he's going to be very effective. And he offers something slightly different to Son on the left, he certainly offers something slightly different to Kulusevski. I mean, people are going, oh, how, how is he going to break into Son, Kane and Kulusevski? It's a fair question, but there are so many games. There's something like six in October alone uh, that these guys are going to be having to mm. contend with. So having Richarlison in there, I mean, there's talk of why the Premier League are buying so much. I think they're just stockpiling ahead of what's going to be a pretty horrific season in terms of injuries next year. I'll be, I'll be amazed to see which of these stars make it all the way through to the World Cup quite frankly. Um, I mean, he's, he's pretty fit as well. He only missed eight games last year, nine in the four years before that. He's in the top 8% for forwards of pressures, top 5% for tackles, top 7% of him uh, for interceptions. That really continues to like paint the picture of someone who, who he's a hard grafter as well. And I, I, I think he's... He's called like Pombo or something like that. He's called the Pombo. He's, he, he's really quite, really well regarded in Brazil for the kind of where he came from. I think he had a particularly tough start to life and he's, he's built himself up. So yeah, I, I'm really excited for him. I think this is a massive loss to Everton. They need to make some moves in the market at the moment if they're going to have any hopes of sort of uh, offering some firepower beyond Calvert-Lewin, who I won't be surprised if they move on last season. No player in their squad created more than two chances a game last year, so really shows what Richarlison was having to work with. I'm super excited to see what he can do with this excellent squad of players around him. Even like Perisic, I think that's an amazing free signing for a couple of seasons, given everything that he's won and all of his experience. I think that midfield is going to be rock solid. I, I, I just... Fullbacks are looking pretty much better under Conti. I'm I'm really excited to see what is, what's going to happen here. Is this as good as Gabriel Jesus? Hard to say. Rafinha, I certainly think this is better value than you're getting out of Rafinha. And I just think for Everton, sorry, for Tottenham specifically, Richarlison is an absolutely wicked addition. And yeah, I think we're really going to see him fly in a better team next term. Okay, I mean that's a really good that's a really good kind of a run through of what Richarlison looks like because. It's strange, isn't it? Last season, he was playing much more as a striker in the absence of Calvert-Lewin. But as you say, in the past, has been much more of a hard-working kind of inside forward. Um, and that, from that point of view, it does seem about as good a signing as Spurs could make. Somebody who can play wide, can play through the middle. Um, is he at Suns level? No, but who is? Mm. Um, and it's definitely a player who can come in without really dropping the quality of the side. I do mm. have concerns, though. <laughs> one I actually think that's a really high fee I think that is a high fee um, and I think that last season I wouldn't want to pay that money for the Richarlison of last season I don't think he was very good this season just gone if I get the Richarlison of the season before and the season before that I'm totally happy because I want that hard working Richarlison who does tons of ball progression loads of defensive work on the wing this season his numbers were not great I think he was pretty mediocre by his standards, to be honest. Fewer shots than ever before. Obviously, defensive work down. Obviously, progressive work down. 
it wasn't even like those things were being compensated for with better attacking numbers. And my other worry here is, of course, long season. Um, not this one just gone, but the one before. Then went into a long summer. You know, this is a guy who's played who's played uh, at international level for his team and then went to the Olympics and played there as well. And oh, then yeah. went back to the Prem and went into another long, really gruelling campaign hmm. where he essentially played every minute he was fit for. Those are my concerns. So I'm really hoping that he gets, it seems odd to say, because he isn't going to be a starter, but I really hope he does get a decent amount of rest because I think he's going to need it to get to his best. If one of that Spurs front three gets injured early on and Richarlison has to play all the time, then I get a little bit worried because I think this guy hasn't had a rest in a very long time. But uh, in, I completely hear what you're saying about that. That is fair enough. But do you really think that the fee is that big of a deal? Like, I know it seems a lot, but at the same time, that. the amount of money they spent on Tango and Dombele, you'd rather be investing that in a proven Premier League player like Richarlison. It's not as if anyone's expecting him to go in and be the starter. I think there's this, there's an element, the, you... pres the pressure is off him to succeed I'd be Barcelona spending their more finite resources on someone like Rafinha I think is much worse than Tottenham splashing out Richarlison and like I've said I think they underpaid for Basuma they've bought in some really smart free transfers and I think they've they, they've sold well as well and I think they're going to continue to do that too Paratici's done a great job since he's gone in there extracting uh, value in the market even Bentancur coming in for what 18 million euros is a snip Kulazeski's never not ever going to cost them an arm and a leg by Premier League standards Tottenham have the cash to spend I really don't think it matters that they're spending 60 million on a player like Richarlison I, it's not extortionate if you're looking at the 80 70 million if you're into sort of the silly figures then yes I do completely agree but I think at this point in time given how much every team is spending in the market at the moment 45 million being dropped on Calvin Phillips etc I really don't think 60 million on Richarlison is a stupid overspend I think it's actually quite a smart yeah, but, investment yeah, but, no but your your spending isn't assessed relative to the spending of other teams your spending is assessed relative to what it prevents you doing in the market so it doesn't matter that Man City have spent 45 million on Calvin, Calvin Phillips it doesn't even matter how much Barcelona could potentially spend on Rafinha that doesn't matter what matters is if Spurs spend 60 million on Richarlison, are there things that they would otherwise have been able to do that they won't be able to? I completely agree that they've got other guys at below market rate. Richarlison, I'd say they're paying probably slightly above market rate. That's not a huge criticism. I'm just saying that if, for instance, it means that the centre-back they go and get this summer is not as good as they would have been otherwise, then obviously that's a cost that you have to, you have to factor into the deal. In every deal, there are there are kind of opportunity costs priced in, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the issues with overpaying here is what does it do to their defence? I don't have an issue with it overall. If they have the money, it's fine. And like I say, I think it's a good signing. He's a huge physical danger and he's incredibly versatile and he's incredibly hardworking. And I think the weaknesses there are in his game, Conte's probably going to iron them out. But it is a lot of money. That's all. Yeah. I th he's never played under a coach like Conte. And provided mm. the the Italian actually stays there, which I know, Pat, you're sceptical about over the oh, next 12 months' time. Um, I, I do think that we're going to see a massive elevation in his game. And I, yeah, I just I just think we're still so early in the window. There's talks of Rondon being moved on for. I think they're going to get premiums for there. I still wouldn't be shocked if they go out and get someone like Bastoni or De Vrij at some point. I really, I really think that Tottenham... They seem to be really smart about this window, and I, th I, I, st I still think that 60 million is not a bad investment to finally plug a hole, to finally find a reserve forwards who you know is going to do the job behind Harry Kane. Because how much money have they wasted trying to fill that hole in previous years? I mean, so yeah, in, I, I, I don't have much more to say on it, but I, I really do think that it's 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 a price worth spending to just fill the amount of gaps that Tottenham have been crying out to to plug in the in previous seasons. Hmm. So, Zacho, Henry's, mm -hmm. Henry's given a good argument there for why Richarlison is a good fit for Spurs. But I know that you were going to talk to us a bit today about Rafinha. And this is a bit more of a complicated one because at one stage yeah. it looked like maybe he was destined for Arsenal. Then it looked like he was going to Chelsea. And now it looks like it may well end up with him getting his dream move, which was Barcelona. <laughs> now, obviously, mm -hmm. the fit at each one of those clubs would have been somewhat different. And it's, 
it maybe would have been the easiest to see him fit in at Chelsea. But what do you think of the player? Where do you think he would have made the most sense? And why? what do you think of Barcelona moving for him if that ends up going through? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're definitely right in terms of Chelsea being the best fit for him. There was kind of the place there for him to, to go into with Arsenal. I remember when we've spoken about it before, um, we've, we've often spoken about how it would very much be a rotation option. Um, the thing with Rafinha, a bit different to say um, Richarlison, is he's not really a guy you can be playing at through the middle or mm. on the left. Like He's very much a right winger and that's where he needs to play. So unless you were going to move um, someone like Bakayu Saka over to the left or, or put him in a different position, um, which I don't think you should be doing, you shouldn't be changing uh, Saka's uh, position from where he is amazing at to, to get him to do something else, um, to fit in Rafinha, then for Arsenal, he was going to very much be a rotation option. Um, Saka has played a lot of football. He's, you know, he's 20 years old and, and he's been featuring now for the past three years consistently um, for club and country. And so that's not to say that they're a, a rotation option um, isn't maybe needed at Arsenal, um, but sort of the level of uh, someone like Rafinha, where you're going to be paying like close to, close to if not more than sixty million pounds, um, is a lot of money to have as a a bench option. Uh, that's my only kind of thing with what we'd mentioned with Richarlison, and the only other thing I'd probably say about Richarlison is, is he going to be good enough to take over from the likes of, from the likes of Harry Kane or um, or Hyung Min Son. Um, but yeah, um, but uh, but yeah, no. As for Rafinha, um, it does look like Arsenal's out of the question now, anyway. So it doesn't really matter too much, and it very much is between between Chelsea and Barcelona. Um, as you mentioned, this is a guy whose dream move is Barcelona. <laughs> um, he want he, and and like many often, and like often for for a lot of Brazilians growing up, like you're watching Ronaldinho, you're watching um, legends play for for Brazil, Dani Alves, and and that is that is. Um, uh, your dream move you're not from a sp english speaking country like you're from uh, uh, portuguese or you know in certain areas spanish um and uh, and and a move to barca is, is that dream move so it makes sense um but does it make sense in my opinion for barcelona no um barca have a lot of options and and again like i don't think you can keep dembele and rafinha um, and I think, not that it's necessarily a risk, but I think personally, you've just had Dembele have his best season ever. Um, ar well, arguably, at least uh, statistically, especially um, finishing the league as the highest uh, uh, assist maker um, and getting and, and relatively being injury free as well. Like You're finally starting to see a, a Dembele who could be consistent um, and you'll be wanting him to play on the right wing. He's only 25 years old. Rafinha is 25 years old. Um, I think for any of these guys that you're you're willing to maybe have um, rotating around that in that position, um, you're going to need someone that's going to be a bit more willing to be a bench option. I don't think either of those two would be willing to do that. They both want to be in the first name of the team sheet. They both want to be starting um, week in, week out. And they both probably deserve to be um, as well. And that's why when you look at maybe the move to Chelsea, it did make a bit more sense. There were already rumours of Hakim Ziyech moving... Um, moving off to, to Serie A to go play for AC Milan. Uh, he's not necessarily the same player, but a similar player to that. Um, and also a player that apparently Thomas Ducal had been wanting um, to, to play for Chelsea. And so he'd be getting that starting option. Whether Chelsea would then change formation to a 4-3-3 or something like that, it remains to be seen. Because I don't think he would be playing um, right wing back, to be honest. So he'll definitely be fitting in. Um, and again, like you, you would expect him to be starting a lot more at Chelsea um, than he would at Barcelona. I don't see a world where Barcelona keep both of these or get both of these players in Dembele and Rafinha. Um, and so I think whichever one they did get would be absolutely fine. Um, but I just feel like maybe it's safer from the Barcelona point of view to go with what you already know, especially after someone who, is, uh, especially as he's just come from a season where he looked really good and can be kick and can continue to develop. I mean, numbers wise, like uh, Rafinha is is very good. Like we know that we saw that last season in the Premier League, um, he was he was very decent. He got eleven goals and three assists. Though his xG uh, or his expected goals and assists was eighteen, um, and that's in 
you know, even more impressive considering he's playing it for, he did that for a, a lead side that looked really, really poor, um, especially at some points under under Marcelo Bielsa. Um, and the other thing, I guess, that he's maybe a bit more than than, than Usman Dembele is like defensively, he he works. Like he's another kind of guy who's, mm. who's a workhorse. Um, he's top three for uh, wingers for pressures. He's making three tackles and deceptions a game. Um, and if that's how you want your, your wingers to be playing, um, which in, in terms of the Chelsea system, he definitely, Thomas Ducal definitely does want them to do, then he's perfect for that as well. And I'm sure Xavi could also uh, could do that as well. Um, the only thing, as I mentioned, with him going to Barca is that like they've, they've kind of got, so many already doing a lot of stuff like yeah. Pedri's there for the build up mm. um, they've already got loads of players that can play out wide I mean given that that obviously they are probably lacking a little bit more in the right side of players than the left side of players but still Gavi, Fati, uh, Ferran Torres I mean God knows if they get Lewandowski where Ferran Torres is going to play because this is a guy that was meant to be playing striker and now they're going to have to sh- shift him out onto other other positions obviously if they do go on to keep Depay and Dembele uh, they've got these guys that can play out wide Um and so it it does make me question. I just think for Barca, if you're there and you're and you're looking at um, Rafinha or Dembele, you just might as well keep Dembele. Like especially if you've just come out of yeah. this financial bit mm, and yeah. you're like, okay, and and it seemingly as well seems that you're going to get Dembele to cut his wages a bit. Mm. Um, then it, financially, it makes a bit more sense to go with what you already know because I just think it's hard to please both of them. Um, but. That sounds quite negative on Rafinha, but Rafinha is very good. Like yeah. on the ball, fantastically well. Um, he he's obviously Premier League proven as well, which I think is something that Chelsea need to be doing a lot more um, rather than taking some of the risks that they've taken recently over the past couple of years in the likes of Timo Werner, in the likes of Hakim Ziyech. Like you know what this guy has done. Um, I mean, to be honest, the last Premier League player I feel like Chelsea bought was like Gary Cahill. Um, and that worked out all right. <laughs> he won the Champions League and, and the Premier League. That wasn't too bad. Um, but yeah, no, overall, like I think whatever you're getting for uh, for Ravinia, um, whatever club Ravinia joins, like he'll be he'll be fine for them. He'll be great oh for God. them, in fact. Um, I would maybe say 60 million is a little bit, a little bit too much, a little bit too much. But also this is a player who is worth um, 60 million to Leeds. Um, and and it's a it's one of those ones where if you want him, you're going to have to pay the premium to get him out of Leeds. Um, and the only question I would have if you were Chelsea maybe getting him is do you want a player who, who will want to um, be joining another club, uh, i.e. Barcelona being his dream move. But I feel like he's a guy that, like, at the end of the day, would crack on and, and wouldn't make too much of a, uh, a fuss out of certain things and, and do interviews and uh, things like that. Yeah, I think he'd be delighted to go to Chelsea. You know, he'd get Champions mm-hmm. League football. He'd have a dedicated role. He'd have an excellent manager, the most established manager out of the three options available to him. Um, but I agree with all your points about, you know, he... You're pretty much dialed into playing him on the right if you sign Rafinha. That's where he's good. And it does seem an odd fit for Barca because, okay, you get more defensive work from Rafinha than you get from Dembele. That's undeniable. But Mm -hmm. Dembele gives you more creativity and more ball progression than Rafinha. And not like a little bit more, like a lot Mm -hmm. more. You know, Rafinha, like a third of his key passes last season from corners or free kicks still still a creative player um still completes a couple of dribbles a game still at something like nearly six progressive carries a game which is very good but Usman Dembele is at 14 progressive carries a game (laughs) this is a guy who's constantly driving his team forward he's completing four dribbles a match he's dribbling into the penalty area twice as much as Rafinha he's passing into the penalty area twice as much as Rafinha He's just relentlessly moving his relentlessly moving his side forward, and yes, he's playing for a better team that dominate territory. But actually, even the bad leads, it wasn't like they were totally toothless in attack. They were bad because they were incredibly open at the back. Um, they were still moving the ball into the penalty area reasonably well. They just had nobody getting shots off or scoring when they got there. Um, so I don't know. Like Rafinha gives you work rate and build up, but. I kind of agree, like £60 million, it just feels like I want a guy who's like kind of a a game changer for that amount of money, Mm. you know? And I I just don't really, I don't quite see it with Rafinha to Barcelona. Maybe for an Arsenal type side, he would be. Do you not think that in La Liga, 
he, I, I think Rafinha would be fairly prolific. I think this idea that Dembele, Usman Dembele is not going to be available for the whole season. He's just not. Like sure. he never has been. He will be. He will appear for certain stretches, be amazing. But on the whole, I don't think it's bad to have a a reserve option there. And do you not think that Rafinha in that league? Because actually, I think Rafinha has been pretty amazing for a. Um, for a sort of a struggling Premier League side, you're right, they're pretty good going forward. But I think he's been pretty exceptional to stand out in the way that he has uh, at Leeds United. I, I, I do think that 50, 60 million is, is probably what he's worth. It's just Barcelona are crying out for new fullbacks. They're, they're crying out for other areas of their squad to be improved. Yeah. And as you said, like yeah, it just yeah. it feels like their squad building is... Feels like the way I write an essay, which I put down every single word in my head until I'm thousands of words over the word limit, and then panic and spend <laughs> ages trying to reduce it down again. So that um, that seems to be what they're doing right now, just stockpiling all this talent and hoping that it'll all muddle together in the end. I don't really understand it at well, all. Uh, and well, and, and, and everyone says, oh, maybe they'll get rid of Depay, maybe they'll get rid of Aubameyang, mm. but like you've got to be able to move these. Yeah. Like that's the thing. If you've got Depay there, you might as well use him. He's a good player. Like it just. It, I understand what you're saying, like, th- though this is the first season he's hit double figures in league play, Rafinha. He's never done it before. He didn't do it in France. He didn't do it the season before with Leeds. And so maybe he could become prolific, but there's not much evidence of it at the moment because he's he is much more of a build-up guy. He mm. is much more of a conventional winger, I think, than, say, Richarlison. I don't know. It just... Yeah, you've got Aubameyang, you've got Torres, you've got Fatty, you've got Gavi, you might have Lewandowski... These are players you have to work with. Adding another guy into the mix who's very good, but isn't like... I don't think any of us would say he's world-class. Yeah, yeah. Um, if... Yeah. if, ever, if ever, I, I completely agree with you. But if, if anyone wants to laugh, go check out Sam Obasaki's TikTok laughing at Arsenal for Rafinha rejecting Arsenal for Chelsea, <laughs> only to get stumped there. But, I mean, Zach, just, I'll just quickly, okay. like, with Sterling being linked... And we've just we're about to release a video on maybe like mm. why Sterling is slightly underrated and undervalued uh, as a player. Sterling for fifty million pounds. Would you rather have Sterling or Rafinha as your sort of signature signing on that kind of right hand side of the attack? Yeah, um, yeah. I think I think Sterling's is like forty five with like ten add ons or something like that. So like fifty five. Um, I I I'd probably yeah I'd probably prefer the Sterling move. Um, if you if you get offered me one of them. I'd probably prefer the uh, the Sterling move. Like I, as as great as I think Rafinha is, and I great I think he is on um, maybe creatively and on the ball and and taking on men. Like we've 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 mm, we don't have the best one on one dribblers, but like we have players that can. Basically, Chelsea's biggest issue is scoring goals. Um, and as much as Rafinha did a decent amount, a decent job at that last season, uh, Raheem Sterling has been doing that his whole career, um, and especially over the last six, seven, six years um, at Man City uh, and uh, under Pep Guardiola. And that's Chelsea's biggest issue. Uh, biggest issue is scoring goals. And I'm not saying that Raheem Sterling is now going to is now going to score 25 goals in the Premier League for Chelsea. I, I don't think that at all. Mm. But if Raheem Sterling can can add, say, 15, um, which Chelsea haven't had since Tammy Abraham um, a couple of years, a couple of seasons ago, um, then that's, that's a, a real big game changer because they've always struggled um, with with a, a person that can at least notch up some figures. Like, like this season, it was Mason Mount um, with something like 11. The season before that, it was Jorginho with six. Like, that's the biggest issue. Creatively, like, again, Chelsea do lack lack in that a little bit, but number one is scoring goals, and then um, and then they can kind of go from there. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think Raheem Sterling for for fifty mil is a perfect option uh, to do that. Um, the only thing I was going to quickly say as well about Barcelona is like they finally you know well without set, by kind of selling their soul um have got their finances back in order um and to me if they if Dembele was to stay this is a move to them uh that feels like one that isn't necessarily needed and one that could maybe screw their finances would uh, not obviously not this just one this just one move but if they continue to keep, to keep doing moves like this um whilst also not selling the players like Depay because we've seen that happen and TT didn't want to be sold um because they offer them massive wages and players aren't going to get these wages again wherever they move um then uh yeah maybe this could be the beginning of uh, the whole cycle we've already seen with Barcelona yeah yeah and that is a bit of a worry for them <laughs> um 
and they do seem to have a complete inability to learn the lessons of the past. Um, should we move on to our final player then, which is Gabriel Jesus, who left Man City. He had one year left on his deal, so Arsenal managed to get him for, I would probably say, a bit of a bargain fee of £45 yeah. million. Pounds. Mm -hmm. Also 25 years old, 99 starts for Man City, 87 goal involvements. Um, last season, it was eight and eight, I think, in a just under 1,900 minutes. Obviously playing much more as a winger last season than he had in previous years, but still getting some time through through the centre as well. Kind of feels like um, ideally suited to this centre forward role at Arsenal. They needed a striker who can be a goal threat themselves, but also mm -hmm. who's comfortable dropping deep and linking play, especially when Martinelli plays, who is much more of a forward type winger than, say, Saka, who's much more of a build-up type winger. Um, of these three players we've looked at, Rafinha, the most winger-like, Richarlison, kind of directly halfway between winger and striker, I'd say, and Gabby <laughs> Jesus, more striker. Um, that's probably, like, the, the line I'd put them on. Um, and last season, admittedly, in an extremely dominant team, Gabriel Jesus, top 20% of strikers for key passes, top 6% for expected assists, um, it's nice that he'd be able to play with Nketiah or with Martinelli because, of course, last few years, Arsenal were really dealing with the fact that they had kind of invested a huge amount of money in two guys who played the same position, in Lacazette and Aubameyang. And as much as Aubameyang got a ton of goals from wide, it never quite felt right. The balance wasn't really there. Arsenal were pretty bad at overall as a team in that period. Um, and this feels like a big upgrade on Lacazette. Lacazette, great hold-up play last season. Um, generally, I think quite an underrated player. Um, got seven assists in the league, but only scored four. Pretty bad from 8xG. So even a minor improvement on that. Kind of like Zach was saying there, you know, Gabby Jesus doesn't have to come in and get 20 goals to improve Arsenal's attack. Mm. If he can get kind of 12, 15 of his own, but make the attack more fluid and create more space for the forwards around him then you would hope the whole attack gets better rather than just he comes in and bags a bunch of goals and that's how Arsenal score more goals. Um, generally speaking, big shot numbers from this guy. Over three shots a game. He's hit over four before. No one has got over three shots a game in a season for Arsenal since 2017-18, which was Arsene Wenger's last year. So having a guy who just gets a ton of chances close into goal has been a real problem for them. And the great thing about Gabby Jesus is he combines this with really good work rate. About five successful pressures a game. So about five of his pressures resulting in him winning the ball, which is what you see from players like Urdogo and Martinelli and, and Lacazette, who were all very hardworking last season. Two tackles and interceptions per 90. Not a lot for a normal player, but quite a lot for a forward. Also completing two dribbles a game yeah. last season. That actually would have been the best at Arsenal. Um <laughs> which is quite a surprising thing to learn. But um, that one-on-one -on -one threat basically means that if Arsenal are playing Saka, Jesus and either Martinelli or smith Rowe, somebody like that, pretty much everybody there can shoot, create or beat their man, um, which makes it much, much harder to deal with that team. You know, it was easier for teams last season kind of knowing that they could give Lacazette space to run and he wasn't really going to do anything um you know s similar to the times when we had like Giroud in the team like Giroud had obviously lots of excellent qualities but you could play quite a high line against him without worrying too much well this is going to create more danger for teams I think the concerns about Gabby Jesus obviously people have talked about him underperforming his chances it does feel like he misses quite a lot of chances and in four of the last five campaigns he's underperformed xg that said, his XG has generally been so high <laughs> that he could underperform it and still kind of score more goals than a lot of players do if they overperform. He could he could still get kind of 15 goals while underperforming mm. XG. That says a lot about his ability to get chances, even if it says something about his finishing. Um, my other concern, I think, is, is that it makes Arsenal quite lightweight in the front line. You are. Look, I start to look at this team and I think there's a lot of technical ability here. And players yeah. like Saka, Saka's very strong. He is. But he's still a quite quite a small guy. Where's the physical threat here in a front line that's Urdogor, Martinelli, Saka, sometimes Smith-Rowe, 
Gabby Jesus. I, I don't really see... It doesn't strike fear into me physically, I guess. <laughs> and so you do think about, you know, if you're a goal down in the last few minutes of a game, like, yes, Jesus' movement in the box is very impressive and that will help Arsenal a lot. But without having that physical threat, they could be a bit one-dimensional, I suppose. Oh, you should have, uh, um, you should have, you should have snapped up Valt Veghorst on that che- on that loan deal while well, you could, you could have uh, <laughs> Bajikta stolen from you. <laughs> well, you know, I could have seen it. I could have seen it. He wouldn't have been the worst backup last season, you know. But you, but yeah. you do look sometimes at a player like Calvert Lewin, and you think is Calvert Lewin mm. as good as Gabby Jesus? No. But I if I needed goal, well. I would say no. But if I needed a goal in the last five, ten minutes of a game, Calvert-Lewin would be a guy who I would really like to have on the field. Yeah. Um, not just because he's like... Because he can occupy defenders. Even if he's not winning headers, he's going to occupy defenders. And I, that's really important. But overall, this seems like a great move at a great price. And it feels like what Arsenal have needed for a while. And generally speaking, I'm very happy with this. I think that this makes a lot of sense. Can I... Pat... Just in terms of trying to rank these, do you not think the concern with Gabby Jesus, there's the most pressure on him to perform out of these three, in my opinion. Richarlison, we've accepted, probably isn't. Depends, probably depends isn't, where everything you go. Richarlison goes. probably accepted, not going to get into the starting 11 when everyone is fit. Uh, mm-hmm. Rafinha, a bit more of an unknown quality, a bit of a step up for him. Jesus is coming from a great team. The whole point mm. is that he's now the main man. That's why he's doing it. I was writing last season, he got 55% of league minutes available to him, did incredibly well. I think only once in the entire time he's been at City has he ever got above 55% of the minutes. It's always around the 50, 45% mark. He's widely just been underused by Guardiola. You're saying he has filled a hole at Arsenal. And although, I mean, I sort of disagree that he's only if he scores 12, 13, 14, 15 goals. Like, Nketiah has earned a new contract on the basis of a very strong three months uh, at the end. Martinelli, for all his great moments, is still not, doesn't have the right to be called sort of a great a great striker just yet. He's still a work in progress. Obviously, he had a really horrific injury, which he's working back from. Lacazette, for all of his flaws... Did work quite hard for the side, but did look a bit sort of spent by the end. I think Leon have done great to pick him up on a free. I do think Gabby Jesus is meant to go there and score goals. We've accepted that £45 million is an absolute bargain for him. So we're all saying that he should be worth more. In my opinion, he is meant to be the difference now between Arsenal getting into those Champions League spots and being sort of a near misses for another season, getting in that, staying in the Europa League. I... I I think this has to be a success. Otherwise, we're looking at more wasted money by Arsenal because it's not criticised enough just how much money they've wasted in the market over the years. I appreciate Edu's been a lot more smart in previous seasons, signing young and building for something. But Jesus is ready. He's in his prime. This has to hit the ground running. And that is my massive concern here. Is is he really going to provide the return that we're expecting? I agree that he's a great player, whatever... Yep. But that is my main concern about him. Yeah, but you're eliding two things there, Henry. Like you're 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 saying that you're talking about one thing, but you're talking about two things. So I agree this needs to be a success. I agree Arsenal have wasted a load of money. I agree he needs to hit the ground running. But I don't think hit the ground hitting the ground running only has to come in the form of his personal goal tally. Like I think he needs to get goals. You want him to get significantly more goals than Lacazette got last season. But his first campaign at Arsenal. I am kind of okay with him getting a reasonable number of goals. And it's also about how creative he is. Like, if he gets a bunch of assists, I don't care that much about, you know, just his personal goal tally. And more importantly, I think Arteta doesn't. I think you're entirely right that there's more pressure on him than the other players. And I wouldn't be surprised if Arsenal fans are fuming if at the end of the season he has got 13 or 14 But if he gets 13 or 14 and say, you know, seven assists like Lacazette, then I think that would be a really good season. If he could get like 20 plus goal involvements all in, I would be delighted. I don't necessarily care in what form they come. Now, that doesn't mean that Arsenal fans won't care. I think a lot of Arsenal fans will complain because they still have the kind of 
90s mindset, which is that your striker is meant to come in and score 20 plus goals. And that's the only way a striker can be. But I don't think that's the way that Arteta thinks of it. Um, with these kind of moves, I always sort of think I wouldn't be surprised if they underwhelm, get a load of criticism their first season, then they settle and have a much better second season. It wouldn't surprise me if it went that way. Um, and if I were Arteta, I would do everything I could to tamp, tamp down expectations and keep the Arsenal fans off his back because they're an issue here. <laughs> but um, I don't really mind if he gets a bunch of assists. I don't really mind if he plays a bunch of wide minutes as well. So so Nketiah can get a run through the middle. I don't really care. The main thing is that the attack is working well. You know, it, that that has to be the main thing. If the attack is working well, it doesn't matter who's playing and who isn't playing and it doesn't matter where they're playing. It just matters that the attack is working well. So so that's what I want. I want the attack to be better this season with Gabi Jesus in it. And if it is better with him in it, then I see that as him hitting the ground running, whether every attack results in him getting off the shot or scoring the goal, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, that's completely fair enough. Zach, Zach what do you think? Uh I find it really hard to to, to find negatives yeah. in this move. Like I have all the I have all the moves. Um, I think the Jesus one is the one that makes the 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 most. Not to say that the others don't make sense, but the most sense. That, um, it feels like the perfect fit. Um, it feels like the perfect time for both club um, for both clubs and uh, and player. Um, I think it's really hard to look at this move and be like, well, there, there's there's you know negatives. Like, okay, yeah, you mentioned the underperforming the XG, but as you said, it was he's getting a, a hell of a lot of chances. I still think he'll get a hell of a lot of chances um, at Arsenal, um, and even the, like the lightweightness. Like again, like I could see that being a negative, but even then. He, you know, he's also not the uh, the 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 weakest of guys either. Mm. Um, and 45 mil, like 45 million is such a, such a coup, such a coup nowadays for a, for a guy in, um, who's obviously been performing like he has over the past couple of years for a guy that's just entering his prime. Um, that's a steal. It's a guy that for, for the next couple of, for the next, arguably for the next five years could be leading your front line. Um, I think 45 million is a, a brilliant, brilliant move. Um, so I've, I really do find it hard to sit here and be like, and criticize it in any way, shape or form. <laughs> um, and so the only, my, yeah, the only thing for me is you know the drop off from maybe a Gabby Jesus who's performing really well to a to Eddie and Ketia I think is is quite substantial. Yeah. Um, but you know Eddie as the as the, Eddie as the, the the guy that was warming the bench I don't think is uh you know terrible. But um, yeah, I think you could have maybe done with that 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 like different that different striker mm. per se the guy that as he said the calvert lewin but like those are hard to come by those are hard to come by and, and, and to be honest as as like unless your club is going to make a bit of a risk or a bit of a a weird signing like um like a, a about their course it's it's tough to tough to do so um yeah overall I, I really like probably out of these three i i think jesus is my like preferred and, and probably who got the better deal and and then and then then Richarlison, and then Rafinha. But I mean, the Rafi the Rafinha one's a little bit hard because we don't know we don't know what club he's going to yet. Yeah, we and we don't know how that's gonna how it's gonna pan out. So it could slightly change. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Jesus for me or Je Jesus uh, for me is um, yeah the number one. Yeah, uh, I mean, what what about you, Henry? What do you think about Zach's order? Would you agree? Oh, I mean, I kind of want to argue. I kind of want to just be annoying, <laughs> but. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's pro it is probably the most sensible move. As you say, 45 million. Considering the, sometimes it seems to be there's just a vague gap between 45 million, 60 million, and then 100 million. It just seems to go there, doesn't it? Um, mm. so the, yeah, so the, yeah. So the fact that they've got him for that price, the fact that City are even selling their at quality players to what Chelsea, to Arsenal at the moment is... It's 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 intriguing times we're living in. So yeah, Jesus. Although I do think Richarlison, I think he's going to be the biggest surprise next season. I really think we're in to see something quite special from him. Because I once again repeat, but, Richarlison starts for Brazil, and like Brazil are probably yeah. one of the top two favourites in my opinion to win the World Cup alongside Germany, maybe Argentina in there as well. I really think Richarlison is underrated, and in a good team, which Tottenham are becoming. Once again, Champions League football, I think we're going to see something really special. So on that regard, I still think Richarlison is an amazing move. So I'd probably put him in Jesus' level, but just for a, just for a laugh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> mostly because Richarlison, Richarlison is an inferior player to Jesus and is 
and has cost more. Yeah. However, for years, for years, everyone's been saying, oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's so hard to recruit a backup forward for Tottenham. It's so difficult yeah. to do it because everyone knows they're going to be playing second fiddle to Harry Kane. And now they've gone and got a guy who can not only back up Kane, but can back up Son, do it at a very high level, who's peak age, who's Premier League proven, who's got a ton mm. of physical gifts, is really hardworking, suits the manager down to the ground. I mean, as moves go, it is pretty much ideal if he is if he's if he stays fit and you know, he's not gassed from the last couple of seasons and it the decline in some of his numbers last year was more about Everton than about him. With all those kind of caveats, I think that could be a sensational move. I completely agree. And if it spots them through spells of the season when inevitably they're going to be without some of their their bigger stars then it will prove to be more than worth the money um so yeah i would say i would say jesus and then i would say a small gap to richarlison and then i would say quite a large gap to rafinha not because he's not because he's the worst player of the three I, in fact he might be he, he he's really really good but yeah i have no idea what barcelona are doing as we end up saying every summer. So um, <laughs> thanks very much for joining me today, guys. Is there anything you'd like to point to before we say goodbye? Uh, yes. If you guys want to check us out on other apps, then make sure you're following us on TikTok and on Snapchat, along with Instagram and Twitter as well. Great. What about you, Henry? Do you want to send people to Sam Abasaki's Twitter page oh. where they can see uh, unintelligible updates on Love Island? Yeah, if you want to melt your brain off, then yeah, go have a look. It's uh, it's it's the perfect way to pass the time. But yeah, otherwise, check out Transfer Review on Eurofootball Daily. I think it comes out the same day as this. So yeah, why not? Double me. What, what more could he want? So... <laughs> Wow, double Henry. Okay, uh, thanks very much to you guys for being on the show today and thank you to you at home for watching or listening. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed to the Football Daily Podcast on YouTube or to Extra Time using your favourite podcast app, though God knows when you'll get the next episode. <laughs> um, so hopefully we'll see you before too long. Catch you later. Bye. Bye.